for every bit as bad as King of the Ring 1995 is, was, and always will be, King of the Ring 1996 still remains to this day one of the better King of the Ring shows and certainly one of the more significant and important kind of landmark WWF pay-per-views of this time period. I don't think there's any question about it. You know, you look back at this time and you say, this was the birth of something that went on to become not just something, but arguably as big of a something as you ever fucking had. Uh, you could point to this and you say, this was the true, real birth of Stone Cold Steve Austin. But when you talk about this show, like, for everything that 1995 wasn't, 1996 was. Even when I look at the commentary team. When you talk about on commentary, you had... You had freaking JR there. You had Vince there. And then you had Owen Hart. And I don't know about anybody else, but when you go back and you watch this show, like, Owen was outstanding on commentary. He added so much to this. He really did. Like, if you go back and listen to it, like, the chemistry between him and the other two was really, really good. Owen getting in his cheap shots or his snide remarks sometimes, like, Fucking maybe it's just because I'm a raging Owen Hart mark. That's probably what it is. But I really, really enjoyed him on commentary. But the flow of this show was better. Like, it just felt like for everything that you didn't have with 95, you got here with 96. Like, you come out of the gate, the first official match of the card, it's the semifinal. So you only had the semifinals and the finals for King of the Ring tournament here on the actual pay-per-view. And maybe that was for the best. But you had Stone Cold Steve Austin taking on Mark Merrow. You know, and I always felt bad for Mark Merrow because they brought in Johnny B. Bad and he only knew how to be Johnny B. Bad. And then they saddled him with Sable. And I don't say that to disrespect Sable or even Mark Merrow. The problem is, is when you bring in the blonde with the big fake tits, like, you even heard it, like the fans were chanting for Sable. They're not chanting for Mark Merrow. And, you know, instead of making her kind of his heater, and having people hate him because he's got the big, big breasted blonde at his side. Like they tried to make him likable, but the people were more paying attention to Sable. It's just, eh, it all became a big thing that became a bigger problem down the road. But you also go back and you realize like Mark Merrill could do a couple of nice moves, but he really wasn't a good wrestler in terms of like chain wrestling and actually being able to piece together matches and put on a story. But at this time, you could argue this was the height, the peak of Stone Cold in terms of his abilities as a worker, as a pure wrestler, as a storyteller. Like, he helped lead Mark Merrow to a damn good match here. Is it some greater classic match that you really need to go back and watch? No, but especially compared to some of the other King of the Ring match clunkers that you got over the years, this one holds up pretty well. It was pretty damn good. And you could start to see here, it's, again, it's fascinating when you go back in this time period. Like, you could see... The company wasn't figuring everything out, and they hadn't pieced it together yet. But you could start to see some things becoming evident. You could start to see the changes when you go back to about this point in time of 96. And obviously the biggest revelation of all was getting away from the ringmaster shit and having him become Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, granted, he was coming out to the old theme music. You know, this is before glass shattering anything else. It was really bad, like... You know, you start to, you go back here and you see the evolution of the character. And you certainly see the evolution of the character in this night. And a big, important, significant moment in the launching development and growth of the career of the character of Stone Cold Steve Austin on this night. But Stone Cold Steve Austin won a better match than it had any business being. So he would go on later on in the night to the finals of the King of the Ring tournament to take on Jake the, excuse me, Jake the Snake Roberts, who beat Vader by disqualification. Like, yeah, Jake was in his early 40s here. You could tell he was in really bad shape. But there was something kind of cool about the notion of, like, hey, this is a guy from the past. This is a guy that's got one last run in him. You know, some of the stuff they did storyline-wise in terms of his drinking and everything else is probably a little less tasteful here in 96. But, you know, this kind of storyline here, like, you're positioning him because you're serving him up on a platter to Stone Cold because you know you're going with Stone Cold. And maybe that wasn't your original plan, but you had to drop the hammer on some guys. You know, especially if you're talking about the curtain call. You couldn't drop the hammer on Sean because he's a fucking champion. So Triple H is probably positioned to win this year and ultimately did not. So Stone Cold was going to be there. So now you're putting him up against Jake. You're sitting there 
putting a perfect situation of the young up and comer versus the old guard and you know just the dynamics of that really worked you get past the tag team match between the smoking guns and the godwins where you just think the whole time like is everything sunny talking about probably relating to sex probably because she's a whore ho 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 and that's all you need to know about that i will say out of the first few king of the rings this is probably the most favorable and enjoyable thing that I saw to Jerry the King Lawler because he got squashed by the Ultimate Warrior in less than four minutes. It's always a really weird pairing to me that you put Warrior up against King the King, but maybe it made sense. Maybe it did. And you know, there's a little chuckle in me when you think about Warrior. I can imagine like the whole dynamics of this is like, <laughs> I'm gonna squash Hunter at frickin' WrestleMania 12. I'll do the same thing here with the King. But you know what? It actually worked here. Like, it was clear that this crowd in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was hot for Warrior. Even later on in the night, when they, at, after the main event, when all that shit went down, and they were chanting his name. Like, again, when you see the dark side of the ring, and you see, like, the self-destruction of the Ultimate War, and you see all of these things, and you didn't grow up in this time period, you know, you can point to all the flaws of Ultimate Warrior, both Warrior Hellwig as a person and him as a professional wrestler, and you can sit there and talk about those flaws until they're, you're blue in the face, and they're probably all fucking true. But what you can't deny was that there were people that loved the ultimate warrior. What you can't deny is this dude was fucking over. Like, people want to say he wasn't as over as Hogan when he won the title in 1990. How many people in the history of the wrestling business could ever claim to be as over as 80s expansion era WWF champion Hulk Hogan. There's not a lot of people in the history of wrestling that can talk like that. And certainly as fuck wasn't Ric Flair. There are very few people in the history of business that have ever been as over as that. You know, you can talk about like Austin and Rock. But... You talk about some other guys throughout the territorial days and so forth, but in terms of truly being over to that level, so maybe Warrior wasn't that level of over, but he was still fucking over. Let's be clear here. He was a star, and he was a big star. And even here in 96, he had been gone for a few years, so people were happy to see him again. We can't miss you if you don't go away. Well, you've been gone a little while. You come back, and now it feels fresh, and now it feels kind of cool. And, you know, it's kind of this transition between the older area and this new generation of WWF, but it works. And this match between Warrior and Lawler worked. He squashed him, got in, got out, and get on with it. Fucking fans loved it, and so did I. And then we come to another important match on the show. That is Mankind versus The Undertaker. And this was a match of two characters that you know Vince absolutely loved. He loved the, the Undertaker gimmick. He loved that character. Everything about that screams Vince. It screams Vince gone right. But on the flip side of that, so does Mankind. Mankind screams Vince doing it right. And you have the perfect people to perform those gimmicks. They know how to pull it off. And the chemistry between these two guys in the ring was great. And this, this Mankind character came along, Mick Foley came along, at a perfect time in The Undertaker's career. Because The Undertaker was kind of languishing a little bit. Yeah, he had just beaten Diesel a few months before at freaking WrestleMania, but there was something missing with Taker. And after all those years of kind of like shitty mid-card feuds, like this is the one that breathed new life into The Undertaker character and gimmick and performer, frankly. Like, we can always talk about Kane, and yeah, sure, that's the most important and most notable rivalry in the career of The Undertaker, but the Mankind feud is number two, especially when you think about King of the Ring 1998. But when you go back here to 1996, like, Mankind comes in and you send him at Taker, and what I love about this match was not only the physicality of this match, but the planting of the seeds of the long-term storytelling. When Paul Bearer hit, uses the urn and he accidentally hits The Undertaker, but it plants the seeds like as you go forward, you know, going to SummerSlam in that boiler room brawl and you see Paul Bearer turns on The Undertaker. Could you imagine fucking that? Like, it's just incredible. But then you, when you piece, put the pieces back together, working backwards, you say, hey, maybe he sat there and did it intentionally here like the way they used to do this shit and they don't do it anymore. 
But damn, this was a really good match. So was Ahmed Johnson versus Goldust. Like, you can sit there and think about now how the Goldust character, you know, is kind of a classic thing. But, you know, at that time, like, this character made people legitimately uncomfortable. Legitimately. And not just the fans, the wrestlers, too. Razor Ramon didn't want to fucking work with him. You can imagine Ahmed Johnson really didn't want to work with him because there's all these things of like masculinity being questioned and homophobia. Like, you know, thinking about the mid 90s, like this was a cutting edge type of character that was not necessarily for everyone. But this Intercontinental Championship match between Ahmed Johnson and Goldust was some good shit. Like, this was Ahmed Johnson's first shot at that IC title. And, you know, this was a big moment. And the crowd was into this, and the crowd absolutely exploded when Ahmed won the title. Like, you look back at 1995, and you say, how the hell did they do that show? And then one year later, they put together this show. It legitimately had some good matches on it. And some notable key moments. I couldn't tell you, but they sure did. And then you get to the King of the Ring final, and, you know, part of the whole story is Gorilla Monsoon about whether or not he was going to let Jake compete or Jake continue because Jake had the hurt ribs, what have you. Um, but you know, this was all about Stone Cold and putting over Stone Cold. You would give Jake maybe one hope spot here in the match, which is what they did, but that's about it. But we all know that when we think about King of the Ring 1996, we always think about that one phrase. We always think about that one thing that Austin said, because this is the moment that we point to when he's getting interviewed by Michael Hayes. This is the moment that you point to and you say, this is truly the genesis of the birth the launch, the beginning of everything that came after with Stone Cold Steve Austin. You sit there and you thump your Bible and you say your prayers and it didn't get you anywhere. Talk about your songs. Talk about John 316. Well, Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. And with the little Austin look afterwards. And, you know, at that time, man... Like he played off of Jake being this kind of Bible thumper, I found God type of dude and turned it into his own shit. And this was the beginning, like soon after that, where you could already sense fans were starting to get behind this new kind of Stone Cold character. Like it just was the beginning. And then as you get to later 96, Brett, you know, he's gone at the time. He took some time off. He's doing Lonesome Dove, I think it was, another shit. And then when he comes back in Survivor Series 96, and he says, I'm going to challenge Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like, that was really where the Austin character truly took off. And, you know, you, you see again, like, where you got to navigate through some of the shit of this time period in WWF history. You also get to these moments, and, and it's so exciting to go back and watch to see, like, that birth happen. Uh, and then you get to the main event. You had the Mr. Perfect being the guest referee stuff, and I'm not sure which one seemed more pointless, him at WrestleMania 10 or him here, but nonetheless... You, know, you had Owen Hart on commentary, Mr. Perfect. He's going to call it straight down the line, except you know he's totally in cahoots here with Davey Boy and so forth. Um, but it's Shawn Michaels, it's Davey Boy Smith. Yeah, you didn't want to ever put the mic in front of Davey Boy because he didn't know what the fuck he was doing. You never knew what the hell he was saying. For all the shit people talk about Ultimate Warrior and he spoke in tongues and you didn't know what the hell he was saying, like Davey Boy Smith spoke the Queen's English and you didn't know what the fuck he was saying. But man, when him and Shawn Michaels got in the ring, magic happened. Like, I could watch this match over and over and over again. Sure, you had spots, you had big signature moves, but you had storytelling dynamics. You had these guys getting heat. You had these guys working off of each other. Their timing, the chemistry was just outstanding. You know, this is Shawn Michaels at the peak of his power as an in-ring performer. And to me as well, Davy Boy, kind of like the peak of his power as an in-ring performer. And, the, and these guys could fucking go, and these guys put on, to me, an absolute classic. Like this only silly, stupid thing about this was when Mr. Perfect sat there and he comes in and delays Earl Hebner from the count, but then he goes one, two, and then Owen pulls him out. Like some of this shit just sometimes was really stupid. But this match was a freaking classic. Especially in the early years of King of the Ring. Are you fucking kidding me? But then afterwards, like, instead of just giving Sean his big moment, like, they sit there and having him get an attack by Vader and Davy Boy and Owen. And now out comes the freaking cavalry. Here comes Ahmed Johnson. And it's fascinating. We go back and watch again when you talk about people being over. Like, it's three on two and fans chanting, warrior, warrior. And then he comes out and the place goes fucking unglued. You're like, oh man, I want to see how they followed up on that. Of course, you know they freaking did it because warrior was gone 
soon afterwards, and they replaced her with a now baby faced Psycho Sid. I always wonder what would have happened with Warrior if he'd have stuck around a little bit longer. Maybe it's for the better that he didn't, but when you go back and watch King of the Ring 1996, to me, this is one of the two signature shows in the whole kind of King of the Ring anthology from 93 to 202. You know, so you might have other matches and other shows that you might have liked, but there are only two that really matter. There are only two that are really memorable. There are only two that are really significant. It's 96, because you argue the birth of Stone Cold Steve Austin, the true birth of Stone Cold Steve Austin, and then obviously King of the Ring 1998. We still talk about that one match over two plus decades later. Like that match has transcended time, is memorable for all time. And this promo by Stone Cold in and of itself is memorable for all times. But what it can gloss over is the fact that this was actually a pretty good show. You had several matches on the card that delivered. Like, it wasn't perfect, but man, they were starting to do a little bit better here in pockets and moments in 1996. And this certainly was a decent show.